Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to worship and also to welcome those of who are joining us online. Um, every once in a while I get a, a very thoughtful email from somebody who's been uh, with us online and wants to engage on something and so uh, I give a, a special welcome to you and I'm glad that we're all here. Uh, draw attention to the welcome card in your pew if you're visiting with us. Draw attention to uh, birthdays and anniversaries as well, an excuse to greet people and bless them in particular. I wanted to share the news that Chuck Blue passed away this last week. Uh, many of you old timers uh, would know him, so keep um, his family in your prayers. There's a string quartet uh, having a concert here this afternoon at five o'clock. Um, an exceptional opportunity to, to get some very professional music, so I'd uh, encourage you to join us for that. Um, Rebecca St. Pierre has an announcement. Do I see Rebecca? Yep. I don't see Rebecca. But Look at the screen. Can you hear me? Speak from on high, Rebecca. I'm speaking from on high. So the Sunday after next is the first Sunday of Advent. A little bit hard to wrap my head around but it is in fact the case and boy do I have an opportunity for you all of you so next Sunday after the service you're all gonna go up to the classroom for the discussion time because if you haven't been to the discussion time you're really missing out you should go it's really good um, so you're all going to go to the discussion time, and then after the discussion time, I have three opportunities for you, no matter who you are. Um, opportunity number one, you know how beautiful this sanctuary is at Christmas time. We have gorgeous decorations, it just looks wonderful, and that doesn't happen without putting up a lot of stuff. Um, so we're looking for help from any or all of you who would like to help us put up stuff, and we have lots of stuff to put up, and we would love to have you join us for that. But Rebecca, you say, I am too old or I'm too young, I can't put up decorations. No problem for you, we have a craft. And it's a Christmas craft, you'll be making a Christmas ornament, and if you're not able to put up decorations, we would love to have you join us to put up the Christmas ornament. And if you say, well, I don't want to do that either. Third opportunity, we're going to feed you lunch. So yeah, we would love to just have you come join us for lunch. Just sit and talk to us. So there is no excuse. One of, you, one of those items should work for all of you. And we would love to have all of you. So before you head upstairs to, your, to the discussion today, you should walk out to the narthex and put your name on the clipboard. That way I'll have some idea how many people we're feeding for lunch. So I hope to see you all here next Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thanks for making a plug for the discussion group after, uh, after the service today. Uh, finally, we are committing ourselves to being of some support for the Salvation Army bell ringers this year. Uh, there's a display to remind you of that out in the narthex, uh, but I would direct you to see Gail, Gail Kevnack, for any more information on uh, time slots or any questions you might have about that. Um, I'm delighted that you're here. Let's still our hearts and prepare for worship.
Good morning. And thank you to the Korean for that beautiful prelude. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. O oh, gracious and holy creator, intelligence to understand you, patience to wait for you, a heart to meditate on you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Dear God, the whole world is full of your beauty and goodness. Help us remember that we are part of it. Thank you for the gift of this day, for the gift of this community gathered here, for the gift of life. Help us shine your light of love everywhere we go, this day and always, in the way and in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 410. God is calling through the whisper. Please stand if you are able and join us. If we would see Jesus, we must open our eyes to the ways we have not followed as disciples. If we want God to create new hearts within us, we must acknowledge the old ways in which we continue to live. Let us prepare our hearts as we long for wholeness. And let us pray together. Please join me. O oh, beloved, your love is boundless. Your grace is greater than our sins. We hide from you and others, afraid to receive or give love. But when we hide, you look for us. You find a way into our barricaded hearts. Cleanse our hearts of fear and resentments. Help us to receive your love and forgiveness and to offer the same to others. A new heart, a generous spirit, a fresh start. These are the gifts our God gives to us. Through Christ, we are able to become new people. Through Christ, we are able to love God with our whole heart. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Let us offer our prayers of intercession to God, confident that the love of Christ will appear in our lives in surprising and unexpected ways. There'll be a refrain, a call and response, uh, when I would say, O oh God, make speed to save us, your response will be, O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Let us pray. We pray for all who seek your radiant light in the darkened corners of our world. May we find our way to you through our love for one another. O oh God, make speed to save us. We pray for all who are oppressed by institutions and structures unjustly ordered. Bless us with the joy for justice, that all may share in the blessings of this life, walking in right relationship with you by caring for our neighbor. O oh God, make speed to save us. We pray for all who have no work, for those without adequate health care, and for all who hunger or have no shelter. Bless us with meaningful work and ample provision as we love and care for each other under the protection of your sheltering sky. O oh God, make speed to save us. We pray for all who suffer violence on dangerous streets and in worn, torn places. Keep them from harm's way. Bless us with your vision of peace, that all may flourish as one family under God, with justice and freedom for all. O oh God, make speed to save us. We remember before you all who have died, that they may know your peace. Bless each of us with a sure and certain hope of the resurrection, that we may know our risen Lord as we share eternal life with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God is a gracious giver who opens the door to all who seek the wisdom of God's ways. Therefore, let us offer the gifts of life and labor and come into God's courts with praise. Prepare your hearts as we receive our offering.
pray. O oh, great and loving God, we give you thanks that you have given your faithful people a love for justice and the gift of generosity. Bless these gifts and with them reveal your righteousness as we await the coming of your peace. Amen. I have a somewhat unusual poem to share with you, but it's a poem about being totally invested in a dream, a, a prophetic dream in God's dream, entitled Prayer on the Red Sea Shore. If these walls of water fall, O Lord, let me drown with Moses, and let me praise you with my final breath for lending me this mad prophetic dream for letting me wander out past the edge of this world beside a man who could see all the glory of Egypt and still say it wasn't enough. If these walls of water fall, O oh Lord, let me drown with Moses. Let me die with the same fire in my eyes Moses saw in a desert bush. Let us join together on our hymn of preparation in the midst of new dimensions, 315.
Our scripture reading is brief. I must say, as I envisioned this sermon series, it was purely coincidence uh, that the topic for today would line up to equip you for Thanksgiving conversation. That's not the thought, but it just happens that way. Matthew 20, verses 25 through 26. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Let us pray. Lord, guide our hearts and open our imaginations as we tackle difficult conversations Most of all, we pray that we may see things through your eyes, through the radical grace that you offer, and the profound calling to which you call us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're continuing our series where we are tackling certain topics that were raised in a survey that was conducted a a month or so ago. And I was a bit surprised to see how many people checked the box for this topic today, the church and Christian nationalism. So it's clearly been on your mind. Though I'm not convinced, I'm sorry, though I am convinced that this is a most important topic. Um, I've, I've been influenced somewhat by the adage that I've heard growing up that there's two things that you don't talk about in polite conversation, religion and politics. So I do approach this topic with some timidity, but I think my approach is going to be to lay the foundation in terms that are as broad as possible and count on you being wise enough to work out your own application. I think first we really do need to define some terms. And for that I need to give credit to Dr. Paul Miller for helping me to to frame my thoughts today. He's a, a deeply committed Christian, a professor in international affairs at Georgetown University, and a research fellow with the the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. First, is is patriotism good? Patriotism is the love of country. It is different from nationalism, which is an argument about how to define our country. Christians should recognize that patriotism is good because all of God's creation is good and patriotism helps us appreciate our particular place in it. As Christians, it's good to love the United States, which also means to improve our country by holding it up for critique and working for justice when it airs. So what is nationalism? Most scholars agree that nationalism starts with the belief that humanity is divisible into mutually discrete, internally coherent cultural groups defined by shared traits, such as language, religion, ethnicity, or culture. From there, scholars believe that these groups should each have their own governments, that governments should protect and promote a nation's cultural identity, and that sovereign national groups provide meaning and purpose for those human beings. So what then is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism is the belief that the American nation Nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, not merely as 
an observation about American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Some say that America is defined by its Anglo-Protestant past and that we will lose our identity and our freedom if we do not preserve our cultural inheritance and that Christianity should enjoy a privileged position in the public square. Russell Moore, a former spokesman for the Southern Baptist Convention, writes, Christian nationalism is the use of Christian symbols or teachings in order to prop up a nation state or an ethnic identity. So what's the problem with nationalism? Well, humanity is not easily divisible into mutually distinct cultural units. Cultures overlap. Their borders are are fuzzy. Since cultural units are fuzzy, they make a poor fit as the foundation for political order. Cultural identities are fluid and hard to draw boundaries around. Attempting to found political legitimacy on cultural likeness means political order will constantly be in danger of being felt as illegitimate by one group or another. Again, Russell Moore writes, it's dangerous for the nation because it's fundamentally anti-democratic Christian nationalism takes a political claim and seeks to make it ultimate. It says, if a person disagrees with me, that person is disagreeing with God. No democratic nation can survive that, which is why the founders of this country built in all kinds of protections from that. So you ask, is is this really a a real problem? Let's go about constructing their nation. They have to define who is in and who's out, who is part of the nation. But there are always dissidents and minorities who who do not or, or cannot conform to a nationalist preferred cultural template. In the absence of moral authority, nationalists can only establish themselves by force. Scholars are almost unanimous that nationalist governments tend to become authoritarian and oppressive in practice. So what do Christian nationalists want that is different from maybe normal Christian engagement in politics? Christian nationalists want to define America as a Christian nation and they want the government to promote a specific cultural template as the official culture of the country. But can a country be Christian? I can't help but think about Papua New Guinea where I lived for a few years. It was a young country and I was there and they specifically made a point of building it into their constitution declaring we are a Christian country. And yet there was widespread bribery and corruption. Some in the U.S. work to enshrine a Christian nationalist interpretation of American history in school curricula, including that America, America has a special relationship with God, or it has been chosen as a country by him to carry out a special mission on earth. 
and others advocate for immigration restrictions specifically to prevent a change to American religious or ethnic demographies or a change to American culture. Is this dangerous for America? Christian nationalism tends to treat other Americans, like my wife, as second-class citizens. If they were fully implemented, it would not respect the full religious liberty of all Americans. Empowering the state through, quote, morals legislation to regulate contact always carries the risk of overreaching and setting a bad precedent. Additionally, Christian nationalism is an ideology, ideology held overwhelmingly by white Americans, and thus it tends to exacerbate racial and ethnic differences. In recent years, the movement has grown increasingly characterized by fear and a belief that Christians are the victims of persecution. Some, some are beginning to argue that American Christians need to be prepared to fight physically to preserve America's identity. So if that's how it's dangerous to the country, how is it dangerous to the church? Christian nationalism takes the name of Christ for a worldly political agenda, proclaiming that its program is the political program for every true believer. This is wrong in principle, no matter what the agenda is, because only the church is authorized to proclaim in the name of Jesus. It is even worse with a political movement that champions some causes that are unjust, which is the case with Christian nationalism. In that case, Christian nationalism is calling evil good and good evil. It's taking the name of Christ as a fig leaf to cover its political program treating the message of Jesus as a tool for political propaganda, and the church as the handmaiden or cheerleader of the state. How is Christianity different from Christian nationalism? Christianity is a religion focused on the person and work of Jesus Christ, as we see in the Bible and reading the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. As the Bible says, it's a gathering of people from every nation and tribe and people and language, quoting Revelations, every nation and tribe and people and language who worship Jesus, a faith that unites Jews and Greeks, Americans and non-Americans together. Christianity is political in, in the sense that its inherents have always understood their faith to challenge, affect, and transcend their worldly lordies. But there is no single view on what political implications flow from the Christian faith other than Peter says we should fear God and honor the king, pay our taxes, love neighbors, and seek justice. True followers of Jesus are recognized as a people of peace. Recall the words that, of Jesus that we started with this morning. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. 
Christian nationalism is, by contrast, a political ideology focused on the national identity of the United States. It includes a specific understanding of American history and American governments that are obviously extra-biblical, an understanding that is contested by many historians and political scientists. Most importantly, Christian nationalism includes specific policy prescriptions that it claims are biblical, but are at best extrapolations from biblical principles, and at worst contrary, contradictory to them. For those who want to study this more deeply, both from a theological perspective as well as a modern church history perspective, I would point you to the theological declaration of Barman. This was written by a group of church leaders in Germany, most notably Karl Barth, to help Christians withstand the challenges of the Nazi party and the so-called German Christians, a popular movement that saw no conflict between Christianity and the ideals of Hitler's national socialism. This is possibly the most egregious example in modern history of a marriage between church and state. Most Germans took the union of Christianity, nationalism, and militarism for granted, and patriotic sentiments were equated with the Christian faith. The German Christians celebrated the ideal, the idea of a racially pure nation, and the rule of Hitler as God's will for the German people. In September 1933, the Pastors Emergency League was established in opposition to the, quote, German Christians. Representatives of a group of churches called the German Confessing Churches then met in May 1934 and passed this theological declaration that proclaims the church's freedom in Christ. The declaration contains six propositions, each of them quoting from scripture and stating its implications for the present day that they were living in, in rejecting the false doctrine of the German Christians. This declaration was considered so significant and so theologically sound that it was later adopted to be part of our Presbyterian Book of Confessions, part of our Presbyterian Book of Confessions. So what now? It's interesting to note that even today, there are those who think that we need a, a, a similar declaration for our time, reminding us of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's warning that silence in the face of evil is evil itself. One such group contends, quote, to the extent that our government affirms the basic dignity of all people and works deliberately to provide equal access to law, economic opportunity, education, health care, and a healthy environment, we will be loyal citizens. But to the extent it promotes factionalism, racism, fascism, unequal treatment in law enforcement, gender bias or harm to the poor, the oppressed, the disadvantaged, the unwanted, the refugee, and the environment, we declare that we will nonviolently reject and resist." End quote. We have to remember that the early church was founded in contrast to, M to the empire of the time. The church risks its soul when it becomes aligned with empire. 
the idea of Christianity and empire working in concert was unimaginable to the early church, to our early Christians. Richard Rohr reminds us that as the imperial mind took over, religion had less to do with Jesus' teaching on nonviolence and forgiveness, and instead became fully complicit in power, war, and greed. So yeah, I do believe that Christian nationalism is a serious problem for followers of Christ. As you struggle to digest and reflect upon what's been shared today, may you take heed of Jesus' counsel that you be as wise as serpents and as gentle as doves. Amen. I'm always trying to stretch us to learn more about the wide diversity of our confessions of faith. I bet many of you have never read the Declaration of Barm. This is a, a section, so learn from history about how they approach this, if you would care to join with me. The Church's commission upon which its freedom is founded consists in delivering the message of the free grace of God to all people in Christ's deed, and therefore in ministry of his own word and work through sermon and sacrament. We reject the false doctrine as though the church in human arrogance could place the word and work of the Lord in service of any arbitrarily chosen desires, purposes, and plans. The confessional synod of the German Evangelical Church declares that it sees in the acknowledgement of these truths and in the rejection of these errors the indispensable theological basis of German Evangelical Church as a federation of confessional churches. It invites all who are able to accept its declaration to be mindful of these theological principles in their decisions in church politics. It entreats all whom it concerns to return to the unity of faith, love, and hope. Let's join together in our closing hymn. It is a familiar tune. Words will be on the screen.
Sisters and brothers, be swift to listen, make haste to be kind. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Now may God, who creates, redeems, and sustains, keep you fervent in faith, cheerful in hope, brimming in justice, and overflowing in love. Amen. Amen.